Welcome, everybody. I'm Eric Kaufman, uh, Manhattan Institute Adjunct Fellow and Professor of Politics at the University of Buckingham. And I'm delighted to welcome Adam Kirsch, an editor at the Wall Street Journal and author of uh, a new book entitled Settler Colonialism for a, a discussion. Uh, this is a, a very rich um, and interesting book, which I recommend everybody uh, to pick up. But I, I want to sort of get into the meat of this in a bit more depth <clears throat> with Adam. So I guess the first uh, question, Adams, is just how did you come to this topic? How did you come to to write this book? Sure. Uh, thanks, Eric, uh, for for doing this conversation. I'm, I'm glad to be here talking with you. Um, the book, which is a, a short book, I, I wrote it, uh, started thinking about writing it after the Hamas attack last October 7th, um, particularly when I saw how the attack, which killed over 1,200 Israelis, mostly civilians, um, was being welcomed and, and received quite positively in some parts of American academia and in progressive circles. Um, and there were a number of statements that organizations and individuals made right after the news of the attacks arrived, um, embracing them. And most of those statements used the term settler colonial or settler colonialism in some way. And I had been familiar with the idea of settler colonialism as an academic theory. It's something that has become pretty prominent in the humanities over the last 10 or 15 years. But it seemed to me that when people were saying uh, the Hamas attack was resistance to settler colonialism or that all Israelis are legitimate targets because they're all settlers, that this academic theory had sort of passed over into real world politics and it was starting to affect the way people thought about Israel-Palestine, especially young people, and also about the history of this country, of the United States, because as I get into in the book, um, settler colonialism is an idea that was really first developed to talk about countries like the U.S. and Australia and Canada, and then became applied to Israel. And and really, in just thinking about, you know, there have been quite a, a number of books now trying to probe, including my own, trying to pl- probe different aspects of what we might call progressive illiberalism or woke or whatever. And I'm just wondering sort of how you see this book's core argument and where it fits into these critiques uh, more broadly of the culture. I think it, the, the idea of settler colonialism does uh, belong in that universe. I, I say in the book that it's a critical theory, um, which puts it in the same category as other kinds of critical theories like the original um, Frankfurt School critical theory uh, developed by Marxist cultural critics uh, or critical race theory. And what these kinds of critical theories have in common is that they are trying to explain what's wrong with society. What are the, what's the source of the evils in society or what the critics perceive to be evils. And the answer is that they can be traced back usually to, to one basic um, central problem, whether that is class division or racism Or in the case of settler colonialism, it's the origin of the United States in European settlement and conquest. And starting from that premise, the theory allows you to sort of critique a whole wide range of things in American society, everything uh, from capitalism to uh, patriarchy to environmental problems, uh, anything that one might want to criticize can be formulated as a legacy of settler colonialism. Right, and, and that's that's really well put. That critical theory is playing a big role, <clears throat> and I just want to kind of move in to this whole question of who's responsible, in a way, for the rise of this ideology, its propagation. Because I, I had the same similar conversation with Chris Rufo on his book America's Cultural Revolution, and also Pl- Pluckrose and Lindsay's work as well um, on, on critical theory. Which is that to what extent do you see radicals, people who want to radically tear down and transform society as the engine behind this. And and to what extent, as I, you know, in my book, I sort of, my, the argument I make is really that well-meaning, bleeding heart left liberals are actually the engine because they're a much larger group. Um, to what extent do you think that, call it liberal group, is playing a role here in uh, either accelerating or nodding through this ideology. And so I guess my question is, how important do you think the radical intellectuals are in all this? And how important is sort of the be kind, well-meaning type of liberal in all of this? You know, that's a good, it's a good question. Um, One thing that that people sometimes ask is when you see students uh, protesting on campuses, protesting about Gaza, um, and they're talking about settler colonialism, does that mean that they have actually read 
settler colonial theory, or do they really know what these ideas mean? And I think that as with all different kinds of, of ideologies, um, there are people who know a great deal about it, and there are other people who only know the term or sort of a vague idea of what it means. That was always certainly true, for example, with Marxism. There were always people who would have described themselves as communists or socialists, but hadn't actually read Karl Marx, didn't know what the theory said, but they knew that it was a theory about what was wrong with society. And I think that settler colonialism is not yet as popular as some other uh, of these ideologies. I think it's still sort of just beginning to emerge. Um, but it's definitely a phenomenon where things that start out very theoretical and, and in academic settings uh, over time can transform the wider culture. And I think one example of the way that's been happening with this is the rise of land acknowledgments. Um, land acknowledgments are something that I think five years ago, uh, no one in America had ever heard of. They were th something that had sort of just started in Canada. Um, and really within the space of just a few years, it became absolutely required for every university and most arts institutions to have a land acknowledgement, which is a statement basically saying um, this institution is on land that used to belong to a certain Native American tribe and to either sort of explicitly or implicitly apologize for being there. Um, and you can see them on signs or websites, or sometimes they're recited out loud in, uh, in public events. Um, that sort of went from zero to 100 very rapidly. And it's an example of how when an idea starts to seem appealing to maybe a larger liberal audience, um, that it can it can really become adopted very fast. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Just last night, I'm in Vancouver, Canada right now. I went to a soccer game. And this is just, these aren't, pointy-headed university students or intellectuals, they did a land acknowledgement before a cup game. Um, and, and that's the, the degree to which this is permeated. And in fact, 60% of Canadians believe the mass graves myth that there are 215 children buried at a residential school in Western Canada. I mean, the extent to which this has penetrated the, the consciousness of a lot of people is is quite staggering, right? So I'm trying to sort of go from the seminar room to that level of influence. And one of the ways I, I can make sense of it is just that so many people just want to sort of be kind, be nice. And and I actually think be nice and be kind is an ideology. It's not some sort of uh, innocent thing. Actually, it's an ideology on its own, which is really sort of accelerating and force multiplying many of these radical ideas. And I think probably unless we're, we actually start to get to grips with that, <laughs> that's innocuous sounding niceness. I think we're going to be constantly facing this issue. Well, one thing I say in the book is that you know, both in the case of American history and in the case of, of the Middle East, um, the main thing I think that is behind the rise of, of settler colonial ideology is an indignation about injustice. And that's a good thing. That's a virtue. Uh, people are supposed to be indignant about injustices. And in fact, the same thing is true of most radical ideologies. The same thing was true of communism, that it was about, it was based on indignation against injustice, exploitation of workers. Um, the, the question is, uh, what form does that indignation take? And does it lead to solutions or does it actually lead to new and, and often worse injustices? Um, to stick with the example of land acknowledgements for a minute, uh, I think the reason why people have adopted land acknowledgements in this sort of broader liberal public that you're, you're talking about has has signed on to this idea, which at one point would have seemed very outlandish and then quickly became standard, um, is that it's an expression of indignation against a historical injustice. And if you are a, uh, you know, a good moral person, you look at the history of, of uh, European settlement of North America and you say... Uh, this was highly destructive of Native American lives and cultures, and, and many people were killed and their homes were taken over. Um, why why would you not be for acknowledging that? Why would you not sort of make that and at this put that at the center of the national identity? And I think it's a difficult argument to make um, to say land acknowledgments, for example, are, are not telling us anything new that we don't already know about the history of the United States. Everyone who goes to school learns about uh, American settlement in elementary school. And in fact, all you have to do is look at a map of the United States and see how many Native American names are on the map to know that America was founded as European colonization of a land that other people already lived in. But when you say that sort of the first thing that you hear at a public event, like a soccer game or a theatrical performance or university occasion is a statement acknowledging saying 
uh, we don't belong on this land. And in a certain sense, our civilization is illegitimate because of the way we got here. Um, I think that that is a, a bad influence on the way people think about their society, about their country. It, it sort of sets the precedent for thinking um, this country should not exist. There's something fundamentally wrong with the way this country came into being. Um, and in a, in a truly moral world, it would not exist. And I think that that is the basic insight at the heart of settler colonialism. It's saying in a truly moral world, there would never have been European settlement of North America. Uh, by extension, in a truly moral world, there would never have been the creation of a state of Israel because it involved dispossessing Palestinian Arabs. Um, and as far as that goes, you know, it's, it's easy to agree with. The question is, is it possible to play back history in such a way that all the injustices that go to make up our current world are undone, right? Is it possible to do that? And what would be the result if we did try to do it? And I think that the response to the Hamas attack is a great example of how this idea that starts out seeming very moral ends up in an immoral place, because it's saying, well, if the ultimate evil is settler colonialism, and Israel is a settler colonial country, then anyone who attacks Israel and Israelis is doing something good, serving a virtuous cause, and therefore they should be applauded. And, you know, the same logic held for, you know, why why did uh, the Soviets slaughter millions of peasants because they were trying to create a classless society, therefore it was a virtuous thing to do. Um, this is obviously on a much smaller scale, but it ends up being a, a moral impulse that turns immoral in the way that it is expressed and applied. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. I, I don't know if you've seen Paul Bloom's book, Against Empathy, um, Yale, uh, political philosopher. But, uh, he, but one of the points he makes is you know, when we're talking about empathy for certain groups, the flip side of which is antipathy towards the groups that are oppressing uh, those groups that we're empathetic towards, uh, this is often highly selective, right? So we um, might feel empathy for, you know, uh, Palestinians, but not for Jews. We might feel an empathy for someone who wants to transition uh, their their gender, but not to the person who wants to detransition and who accuses the medical authorities of not having safeguarded them. Right. So we it, it's it's always selective in terms of who is it that you are feeling empathetic towards, and I can't help but feel that's provided by ideology. So, so for example, as you point out in, in the book, you know there is really no scrutiny of what the Comanches did to the Apaches and the, the Iroquois did the Hurons. And, and this, this sort of context, this global world historical context of genocide and slavery and settler colonialism. And, and I was just wondering, you know, was there ever a time when, when things were a bit more contextualized and, and a bit more nuanced? <laughs> well, it, it's definitely true that, I mean, I, I think what's interesting about it is that in a strange way, this way of thinking about history is is precisely not about empathy. It's devoid of empathy. Um, what it really is about is a conversation among, uh, in this case, settlers themselves about the kind of people they are and the kind of people they want to be. So land acknowledgments, again, is a good example. When, when an institution does a land acknowledgement, they're in no way, shape, or form saying, we intend to vacate this land and return it to the, the native people who lived here um, before America was settled. Um, they're not saying that they have any legal, moral, economic, political obligation to fulfill, to actually make people's lives better. It's a statement saying we are morally um, so sort of sensitive and empathetic that we recognize how bad this is. And in saying that, we become better than other people who don't recognize it. Um, and one of the things that that I say in the book and that's pointed out by a number of, of uh, scholars of settler colonialism, people who are critical of the discipline, is that it's really a conversation among uh, settlers about being a settler rather than a conversation about Native peoples. I mean, one of the sort of ironies is that if you look at how Native American groups in the U.S. advance their demands in advocacy groups or, or legal rights groups, um, they don't use terms like settler colonialism or decolonization. They talk about things like adhering to treaty obligations, um, forcing the United States to live up to its promises. Uh, so it's not really a, a, a Native-led or driven movement. It's an academic theory movement um, that's created largely by uh, humanities professors in Australia, the United States, and Canada. And the people who are most vocal about it and who it really appeals to are people who see themselves as settlers and sort of embrace that identity and use it uh, as a form of self-scrutiny. Uh, it's a way of saying, what kinds of guilt and, and sin have I inherited by being a settler? And how can I purge myself of them? And in, in that way, there's, it's, there's an analogy to the way that 
uh, you know, critical race theory often leads white writers to talk about whiteness, right, rather than to talk about blackness or black people. It's really about whiteness being a, a, an evil and how do I purge myself of this evil. It's similar with settler identity. And uh, in some places, I, I think this is more common in Canada than it is here in the U.S., but it's it's sort of, I think, beginning to spread. It's common for people to identify themselves as a settler, to say, I my name is so-and-so and I am a settler, in the same way that you would say my institution is, is X university and it stands on the lands of this tribe. Um, in fact, one one per, one thing I quote in the book is a piece by a, a Canadian uh, First Nations writer who says that he and his friends say that settler is a new way of saying white, that it's uh, the way white people identify themselves instead of saying white. Um, but it's worth noting also that in the American context, you don't have to be white to be a settler because in the idea of settler colonialism as a, as a theory is that America is a settler society. And so everyone in the society who's not indigenous is a settler. And that can go to, to places where people don't necessarily expect. For example, uh, you could be the descendant of an African slave, uh, or you could be someone who just immigrated to this country five years ago, and you'd still be a settler in the sense that you occupy the settler position in the power structure, in the, in the way society imagines itself. Um, and in that sense, this is a very different way of thinking about American history than multiculturalism. Multiculturalism was a sort of progressive idea that said America is a sum of many different kinds of people and all of them should express themselves and all of them have something to contribute. Um, and settler colonialism says all of those people basically are criminals. They, they shouldn't be here. Um, the only people who really have a right to be here, who are really sovereign over this territory, are the people who were here before settlement began. Yeah, that was a fascinating part of the book that some of those the real radicals were, were arguing that everybody, not just whites, was in a way complicit in, in this system of occupation. I mean, it was it was quite something. But I guess in practice, you know, if we look practically, often this movement is part of an intersectional kind of coalition on the left, it seems to me. Uh, I guess, I, I, you know, when it comes to, mo I mean, there is a question really about the antecedents here because you, you talk about in the 90s this debate in Australia and, and where this comes from. But I think, I don't know, one could perhaps make the case that multiculturalism also was at least implicitly anti-white in many ways. That is, other cultures are interesting compared to the bland, you know, white one or, or other cultures are, are in some ways not getting their, their collective rights because it's you know the, the so-called neutrality of of the of the liberal state is actually implicitly white. I mean that was already there in multiculturalism in a way. So I guess I'm not sure I would draw as sharp a distinction between the two. But just moving on, I was just going to ask you what you thought. You know, is there any link back to the longer term romanticization, the noble savage myth, the sort of romanticization of the native? I mean, where do you think that fits into this? Yeah, it's definitely a big part of this discourse, especially when you turn from the more academic theorists to the more popular historians who sort of write about these ideas for a larger audience or write the history of America from a settler colonial point of view. There's definitely a tendency to polarize settlers and, and natives or indigenous people in a way that settlers are sort of pure evil and indigenous people are pure good. And that's very continuous with the way that critics of Western society have talked about their own society by using uh, the new world as a metaphor, right? That's something that that really started almost as soon as Columbus came back um, from his voyages of discovery. And in fact, uh, Thomas More's Utopia, which gave us the word utopia, was set on an island in the new world. And the idea was that an explorer had discovered this island where there was a perfect society in which there was no property and no conflict. And, um, the, and, and sort of the explicit idea there was Europe has all these problems and this new world utopia doesn't have them and we should be more like them. And that is an idea that has a, a big role in European intellectual history, including Rousseau and, and the idea of the noble savage. Um, today, I think what you see is, this is often cast in environmentalist terms, the idea that um, native peoples lived lightly on the land as opposed to a contemporary society, which is very uh, you know, extractive and, and pollution, it creates pollution. Um, but as I say in the book, if you look at the five largest uh, carbon emitting nations in the world, um, America is the only one that's a settler colonial country in the way that this theory defines it. The others are just big countries, right? Big, rich countries like China or India. And in a way, the idea that 
what that because people in America want cars, for example, they want to use gasoline or they want to use a lot of electricity, electricity that this is an example of settler colonialism or a settler way of being, a settler mindset, um, is just sort of like obviously wrong. It doesn't, it doesn't address the fact that that's what everybody wants. That's what everyone in the world wants. They want more things and a better life, and that involves using resources. Um, so there's often a sort of wishful thinking about this of saying, if we could get rid of settler colonialism or the settler colonial mindset, then everything would go back to the way it was before 1492. And of course, that's not possible for anyone, whether you're a settler, an indigenous person, or anywhere in the world. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it would be great if, if some of these people could go out and see, uh, so an indigenous logging operation, or, you know, it's just being in British Columbia, I mean, they are involved in the resource extraction industries. And, you know, there's, there's really not some, some different ethic that they have compared to everyone else. But this is where I'm just sort of saying there is this very romantic view. And I mean, there was this survey, a couple of surveys have shown that about 60% of Americans believe that native peoples li lived in peace and harmony before the Europeans arrived. And, and it's higher among younger people. And just where that belief which is completely at odds. In fact, these societies were many times more violent uh, than European societies were. I mean, you just have to look at Steven Pinker's work on this. Uh, the anthropological evidence is pretty clear. But, you know, the, I guess the question is, was it always thus? And maybe it was always thus, that there was this inaccurate view of, of the reality of, of indigenous life. Well, and that that's I, important, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's sort of a, a mirror image of traditional... Uh, patriotic American historiography. If you look at the way American history was written in the 19th century, um, it was very triumphalist. Um, there was a sort of uh, nostalgic, elegiac feeling about American Indians. Once they had been displaced, then the people who displaced them could start to feel nostalgic about them. And you see that like in the novels of James Fenimore Cooper. Um, but so when conflict gave, gave way to memory, it was possible to idealize. But in some of the writing about this history that's taking place now under the banner of settler colonialism, you see basically the exact same tropes that were once applied to Indians are now applied to settlers, that they were in sort of inherently violent, that they employed uniquely savage methods of warfare, um, that they were beyond the pale of humanity, that they, you know, all of these things that, that Americans once used to say about the peoples that they were fighting are now being said about the Americans and the people who were settling. Um, and, and it, it emphasizes the way that so much of this, or really all, like almost all of it, is a discussion about what America is and should be. Um, it's not really about what actually happened in the past. As you say, uh, I think that as as all over the world, um, the earlier and less technologically advanced societies were more prone to violent conflict. And if you look at some of the anthropology or the paleontology, um, you see that there's lots of evidence of war and fighting among Native American tribes. And of course, why wouldn't there be? There would be anywhere in the world. Um, so the idea that because Europeans have certain vices or flaws, that the people who they were against didn't have those vices and flaws is is a sort of perpetual archetype. It's a way of thinking. And then uh, in, a, in an interesting way, in current politics, this gets extended to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict because I think increasingly, especially among younger people, there's an idea that that is a settler colonial conflict in the same way as North America. In other words, the European white Jewish settlers came and dispossessed uh, an indigenous people, the Palestinian Arabs, and that in the in the similar way, the Palestinian Arab life was you know more more spiritually advanced, uh, more in tune with the land. Uh, all these kinds of claims are advanced by different people. I talk about some of them in the book. Um, so the categories from one place get sort of imposed onto another place, which actually has a very different history. And, and just, I mean, uh, moving on to the politics of this a little bit, I mean, you mentioned the history wars in Australia in the 90s. And I'm quite interested, you know, the, the, Ronald Reagan made a speech about American history in, in when he left office. You had these battles going on in Britain uh, at the time, you had these battles going on in Australia about history. The thing that strikes me is, despite the pushback from conservative politicians like Tony Abbott or Ronald Reagan, that essentially the left, the cultural left, won all of these battles uh, and outpaced and out, you know, outdistanced. The education establishment won when it comes to the curriculum. And I'm just wondering why you think that is and whether you think that will continue in a way, um, because if this is key, if, if what's being taught in schools is important to this story. Yeah, well, I'm not an expert on, on education policy, and, and I, I probably don't know enough to say 
the hows of how this happened. But on the level of ideas, I think that this is something I, I sort of try to get at towards the end of this book, um, is that after World War II, I think the way that Western civilization thought about itself began to change profoundly. And that in in essence, that was a good change. That was a necessary change because it it looked at what had happened in Europe in the first half of the 20th century and said that the society that could lead to these world wars and to genocide, to the Holocaust, to fascism and, and communism and totalitarianism, um, that this was not the, the sort of great society, the natural, morally superior society that Europe had long told itself that it was, and that, in fact, it needed to criticize its own roots, or criticize its own origins. Um, that's part of what uh, philosophy and, and critical thinkers have been doing in the West for the last hundred years, is saying, um, what are the reasons why Western history, European and American history, took the form that it did? Um, and in particular, reassessing colonialism. Uh, colonialism was extremely brutal and violent and often by, involved genocidal violence towards Native peoples and killing vast numbers of, of people that were exploiting their labor. And there were always people, when this was taking place, who which from within American or European society criticized it. There were always voices saying um, that this was wrong. But it was sort of the dominant narrative of the West was, this is progress and this is the advance of civilization. So obviously, I, I mean, I, I think that turn in the way we think about Western civilization is is good and, and important. Um, it reminds me of the thing, the joke that Gandhi is supposed to have made when he first visited London and he was asked, what do you think about Western civilization? And he said, I think it would be a good idea. In other words, the West is not as civilized as it thinks it is. Um, but I think that in a lot of ways, what we're now facing, and particularly in America, is how do we retell the story of our history in a way that offers grounds for pride and progress um, and patriotism uh, while also acknowledging the truths, the evil truths about our history, right? Uh, about slavery, about racism, about uh, treatment of Native Americans. And it's very difficult to hold that balance. And it's very much easier to say, um, we used to believe that everything America did was right, and now we realize that everything America did was wrong. And we used to think that it was my country right or wrong, and now it's my country is wrong. Um, and I think that that, you know, in all kinds of ways is a is a poor basis for future of of any country and for adjusting the conflicts that really do exist. Um, and and one thing that this argument of settler colonialism is about is what's a better way to think about our history rather than this very uh, manichae and black and white theory. Yeah, I mean, you raise an interesting question because you talk about moving from the modality of celebration to the modality of guilt uh, over past, uh, you know, sins, if you will. Um, and finding that balance is quite tough. I mean, I think, you know, psychologists would say, you know, if I, you know, shoplifted at age 10, you know, I can acknowledge that uh, as a failing, but actually, in order to have a positive self identity, uh, people need to foreground the positive rather. Th so while acknowledging, the negative, they all stay, what has to be in the foreground is, is something positive. And I guess the question is, you know, whether this balance is really tipped, and I would say that it has, and how do we get back to a position where you're foregrounding the positive while also not trying to pretend the negative didn't happen? Yeah. I mean, one of the, one of the things I say in the book is that um, settler colonialism particularly takes aim at the civil rights idea of American history and the idea that Martin Luther King sort of uh, developed and, and really helped to make the official sort of creed of America for several generations, which was um, a very uh, ingenious combination of those two positive and negative to say, as he said in the March on Washington, um, that the founding documents of America promised liberty and equality to all and didn't deliver it. And that we're now want to claim the promise made in those documents. So he said to have a to have payment on a promissory note, um, and and by framing it that way, what what you do is you say um, America is a a noble experiment founded on ideals of liberty, and it has not lived up to its ideals, and that the more we help it live up to its ideals of liberty and equality, um, the more American we are, the more true we are to the founders' intentions. That is a way of looking at history, which says. Um, there are things to be proud of about America, that the essence of America is something to be proud of, but also demands our action, our participation in order to come true and to improve. And partly for that reason, I think um, 
for both political parties, for a long time, that was sort of the language in which American history was talked about. And I, I quote in the book, you can have speeches from George W. Bush and Barack Obama in which they say practically the same thing um, using King's ideas. But there has been a turn, I think, over the last 10 years into a more radical kind of criticism, which says that not just that the idea of America wasn't lived up to, but that the idea of America was wrong from the beginning, um, that America is something that should not have existed. And when you say that about your a country that exists and that you don't really have any alternative to living in, um, it, it does create really big problems, I think, about the future direction of the country. And also part of this has to do with the polarization of extremes. One extreme polarizes the other. If one side only wants to talk about what's bad in American history, the other side says, well, then we can only talk about what's good in American history. We don't want to teach or hear about the bad things. Um, and it, it really pushes people towards the extremes. And this uh, settler colonial idea is one one manifestation of that. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it, it raises so many interesting points. I mean, I think you know, there are, in the study of national identity, that's one of the areas that I focused on in my academic work. One of the arguments is that there are competing versions of national identity in any society. And, you know, you could argue that settler colonialism is a, a version, actually, of American, let's say, or, or, you know, American national identity, which says that uh, we are virtuous because we are raking over and, and, and bowing our heads for our sin, sins in the past. Trudeau has that concept for, for Canada, basically. We are the most post-national, therefore we're the most virtuous. Um, and, and so I think, and the other problem, I guess the issue is I'm not sure, even though I agree with you, the civil rights narrative is important. I, I think because of the way national identity works, it's often the uh, thousands of symbols from baseball to national parks to, you know, that are making up people's sense of national identity. Um, I just am not sure you can sort of get rid of the sort of more particularistic historical elements. And you mentioned Samuel Huntington, for example, the, the Protestant uh, English heritage. And I think, you know, um, because you could make the arguments that says, well, we're getting better as a country. And so therefore we need to put you know, these dead white males away, because that's part of us improving as America towards this perfect ideal. The problem in a way is that a lot of people have a national identity, which is rooted in those particular founding fathers and concrete episodes. So I don't think just going to the idealistic or the America as an idea thing is going to necessarily solve these issues. There has to be some, I think, acknowledgement that Every group has to be on the same footing. You you can't have the the Mongols celebrating Genghis Khan openly without shame, uh, while while the West has to apologize for everything it's done. You know there has to be kind of a parity here where we get to celebrate the good bits of, you know Lincoln and Washington whatever, um, while acknowledging the bad bits, and we don't just put them in the closet. You know? Yeah, no, and, I think it's, I think you're right, and I think it's very hard to strike that balance, particularly. Um, in public debate, it's very hard to to find a formulation that will do justice to both sides of that equation. Um, but and and one thing that that settler colonialism does is it makes it much easier because it says there's no good. We don't have to worry about the good. There is no good. Um, it was all bad, and we should sort of be constantly searching our consciences for ways to atone for this original sin. And and one of the things that I get into in the book is that. A lot of this discourse, especially on the more popular level, if you look at the way people write in like college newspapers or on social media um, or more more diaristic or memoir-like ways of writing, that a lot of it is really very reminiscent of sort of Protestant soul searching. It's this idea that you've been born with a sin that you inherited. You didn't commit it yourself, but it was in, you, your ancestors committed it or it was committed in the past and you are responsible for it. And how do you search yourself for it to, to sort of become aware of the sin and how do you get rid of it? And a lot of the way that settler ways of being, to use a popular term, um, is discussed has to do with that. It has to do with looking within yourself and saying, am I acting like a settler if I do X, Y, and Z? And how can I avoid doing those things? So it, it's one way in which all of this really has very little to do with what you might think of as post-colonial politics, right? Because post-colonial movements after World War II were about things like power and, and property um, and I think settler colonialism in the U.S. is much more about culture and spirituality and identity. Um, but then, of, of course, when when this moves to the Israeli-Palestinian context, 
I think it does become about power and violence and, and politics. And that's one reason why that conflict is so magnetic to a lot of people is that it's a way of saying, well, here's a settler colonial state that didn't, uh, isn't so permanent and massive like the United States that we can't really imagine it going away. Israel is a country where its enemies have always wanted it to go away and have always attacked it. And it's sort of a live conflict. And so it's very exciting to people to say, to be able to say, this is where the fight against settler colonialism is taking place. And that's what some people said, you know, in so many words after uh, the Hamas attack, they said, this is exciting and exhilarating because it's an example of resistance to settler colonialism. I mean, let's, yeah, I mean, I, maybe I'll pick up a, a bit on that question of Israel because, you know, I don't know if it was in your book or whether I saw it elsewhere, but, you know, the surveys around support for Israel or Hamas, when it's put in a forced choice format like that, you know, we're getting a slight majority, I think, of the under 25s backing Hamas and anyone over 50, it's like, what seems like single digits or something very small anyway. Yeah, I know. I do talk about that. It, there, it's this yeah. very striking thing where traditionally, if you ask people in a survey, do you support Israel or Hamas or Israel or Palestinians? 80% of Americans consistently said they supported Israel. And among people age 18 to 24, it's 50-50. So there's definitely been a big shift in opinion on this among younger people, which obviously as time goes on will percolate up uh, into institutions as well. Yeah, I mean, even and, and some of those surveys actually in terms of should Israel exist or is was it a bad idea? You know, you're getting a majority. And, and I'm just wondering, you know, I do some... There are other questions, you know, not to do with this, but say, should J.K. Rowling be dropped by her publisher? And you're getting a similar 50-50 split amongst the young and, and almost nobody over 50s. And I'm my view on this is that these views are crystallizing because people's brains stop developing in their early 20s. Musical taste, a lot of things kind of are carried through the life, the life course. Uh, and the me as the median voter becomes Gen Z, you know, I I just think there's a lot of complacency out there and not enough focus on what's going on in the education system. And it just seems that cons do you think conservatives are simply not paying enough attention that the education is simply not an important enough issue for them when it should be? You know, I, I don't really talk about education policy in the book, and I don't really know enough about it to say. Um, I, I don't think that, the, that conservatives are ignoring it. It seems to me they're paying a lot of attention to it, especially in certain states um, over the last few years. The problem is that it's very difficult. If you if you see a university system or a school system teaching what you think of as bad ideas, uh, it's very hard to then say, well, these are the right ideas, teach these instead. Um, because first of all, how do you know that the ones that you are telling them to teach are the right ideas? And second of all, how do you make people who disagree with you teach those things. And in practical terms, as we've seen, it's very, very difficult to do that. Um, with this book, what I'm what I'm hoping to do is something more in a classically liberal, you know, uh, John Stuart Mill kind of vein, which is to say, if what we're supposed to be having here is a, a marketplace of ideas, then this is an idea, settler colonialism. Um, let's talk, let's argue about it. Let's say, well, you know, are there other ways to think about these things than settler colonialism? I think that in in a way, um, because universities, academic humanities are very much a political monoculture, it's hard to get any sort of alternative points of view in that environment. And certainly if someone is a scholar or a theorist of settler colonialism, they're not going to say, um, all, but maybe this is wrong, or here's someone who says these, all, everything that what we're teaching you is wrong. Um, so maybe it has to come from outside the academy. People have to make those arguments in ways that are are convincing, or at least show that there are other ways to think. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with you that that you know, because in a way, the power of of emotional blackmail, for example, I mean, I think the ability, for example, in Canada, for example, to suppress debate over the absence of any evidence for mass graves, you know, in the press, in the political class, has been quite striking to me. I mean, there are dissenters; they they are sort of accused of being denialists. There's talk about trying to criminalize that, you know, and I'm I'm just trying to think if. I guess if the other side, in a way, is controlling the narrative, controlling the institutions, um, I, it's okay. It's one thing in universities where people have academic freedom, but certainly in the school, I mean, the curriculum guidelines are set at the state level, and um, surely there's a role for saying, "Look, you know, there, you've got a bad. If you want to talk about stolen land and, and slavery being conducted by the Americans, you've got to pair that with uh, an example of." indigenous or non-European slavery, just to sort of put that in some kind of context, surely that's reasonable because somebody is, there is going to be a curriculum, you know, which, which is set. 
And, and so surely that's a, something that in a democracy we should be allowed to shape according to the wishes of the majority rather than that of the teachers' unions. Yeah, it's a tough issue. Uh, and again, it's probably above my pay grade. But, you know, there are plenty of times and places where if you were to take a majority vote on what should be taught in the schools, it would be some pretty terrible stuff. You know, if you would, if you ask people, um, should we teach, you know, X, Y and Z about people of a different religion or a different race in many places in the world, what you would get is something that you would that I think I and, and most people would find objectionable. So it is very difficult to get to a, a good solution on this on this question. I think it's probably more complicated than just telling people you must teach X, Y, or Z. Um, and, and also people in, are, are very able to interpret uh, orders from above in ways that are that they want to interpret them. I mean, really, it's a question of beliefs and mindsets. And I think that uh, you have to change the way people think about these things rather than sort of, or in order to change their behavior, you have to change uh, ideas. By the way, just and, and just the last couple of questions here. I think I mean, one is about Israel, really, and your thoughts. I mean, is part of the question in Israel that it's simply one of the newer settler colonialisms, if you want to use that term, um, whereas a lot of other places like Turkey, it was 1453. So we're not talking about Turkish settler colonialism. I mean, is is that part of the issue that that it's just closer to the statute of limitations on this question? Uh, that's part of it, and I think a large part of it is that people who study this in uh, Ang Anglophone countries, U.S., Canada, and Australia, are studying the history of their own countries, and they're not especially knowledgeable about other parts of history and other parts of the world. So it's very there are people who do try to do a more comparative approach, but it's pretty rare. Um, if, and settler colonialism is almost you know almost synonymous with modern European colonialism plus Israel. Uh, it's very rare that you'll see people talk about it in other contexts. Um, even though, you know, as I sort of say in, quickly at the end of the book, basically the history of any country is the history of conquest and settlement. Um, there's no there's no history without conquest and settlement. And that doesn't mean that conquest and settlement are sort of inevitable or good or that they should always be accepted, but it means that if you're looking at the history of the world, you can't expect you'll find a pure country that was founded, you know, by a majority vote. Um, there are always conflict over who has power. And if we want less conflict about that in the future, um, this is not the way to go about achieving it. Yeah, I really like the way you make that made that point. And, and in a way, likewise, probably every ethnic group and every culture, almost without exception, uh, had a settler colonial phase. And then that's central to who they are. Um, well, I guess the, the, the last question might be then, you know, do you see, are you optimistic in any way? Or are you pessimistic? I mean, where does this go from here? It's very hard to say. I, I think, as you say, it is hard once ideas are ingrained in institutions, educational systems, um, and, and people are very convinced that what they're teaching is morally right and necessary. It's very hard to change their minds about that. And this is this is definitely an activist scholarship. I mean, that is not just admitted, but it's sort of proudly asserted. Um, again and again, that the idea of studying settler colonialism is to change it and get rid of it. Um, so I don't think I'm optimistic for the near term. I think that we're probably at the beginning of the spread of this idea rather than the end. Well, on that joyful note, <laughs> I'll probably leave it there. And thank you for, for what is a magnificent book, which I encourage everybody to read and, and much shorter than mine, which is probably a good thing. Um, thank, thank you, Eric. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks a lot, Adam.